I'm Paul Pierpoint. I'm the retired Vice President of Community Education and Dean of the Southside Center for Northampton Community College. So I've been on the Southside for most of the last 15 years or so. Well, I had two different titles. One title is Vice President, means I was in charge of all the non-credit we did, including a lot of workforce development stuff. And then as Dean of the Southside, it was my job to develop this facility that we're in right now, the Fowler Family Southside Center, to serve the people, of primarily South Bethlehem, but for the whole region. When we first came here uh, and bought this building and started work on it, there, there wasn't even any legislation about casinos in Pennsylvania. But once the legislation was passed and, and um, Bethlehem was in the mix, I became an instant fan. The, the college was a little more hesitant because they understood the political challenges of bringing a casino into Bethlehem. But I knew it was really important to bring somebody that had deep pockets in order to develop the former Bethlehem Steel property and to bring a lot of good jobs. So um, I shared the people who were on the pro side. I was very much part of that. I, I thought this was a really important step forward for the college. So when they actually got the license, it was like we won the Super Bowl. I mean, it was a big party, and uh, we were very excited because we knew the, the future of South Side of Bethlehem, and, and Bethlehem itself, but uh, was very much uh, altered in that very moment that we got the, uh, the uh, license. Well, if you think about who we serve, as a community college, we serve this community, the people who live here. Um, we serve, the, in general, many of the underserved and underprivileged people who you know, suffer the most when jobs disappear, when the economy goes south. And we saw the casino as a tremendous economic opportunity for people to get jobs and become self-sufficient, independent, contributing members of our community. Um, others, including the other colleges, saw it as a potential threat. You know, gambling is a, can be an addictive behavior, and young people, you know, students, they have to be 21 to get in, but many of our students are 21, so. Even before they had anything going on, before they even had a license for that matter, they approached us to be their um, training provider. They wanted the local community college to be signed on as part of their application to, to Harrisburg to get the license. Um, and of course, we did that instantly. That was not a problem. We wrote the MOU and uh, you know, committed ourselves to being their primary workforce development provider. And then when we got the license, um, the first thing they did was, you know, they, they hired their new president for, for the local SANS and some top end, just the two or three top end uh, um, executives, and they moved into this building where we are now. They became tenants um, in our building, so we got to know them very well. And that created the uh, sort of start for a really solid partnership that continues to this day, you know, more than a decade later. Uh, Bob DeSalvio, and uh, his vice president for human resources and their chief legal officer. They're all here from day one. And we got to know them personally. Uh, they got to know the president uh, very well and all the top people at our college. Um, and because of that partnership that we established very early, the relationship we established very early on, um, it laid a groundwork for a really, really good partnership. This was their hiring center, so everybody that worked there came through this building to be interviewed and, and screened and selected. To, in order to get their license to work at a casino. So at that point, our job, we didn't really do a lot of workforce development initially. Um, we thought we were going to be training like slot machine technicians, but the vendors did their own training. So mostly at that point, we were more of a partner in the community, um, a supporting entity. It wasn't until a few years later when they got, when the table games were legalized that we became a really big training provider. Um, at that point, they needed I think it was 500 dealers, and they needed them in like three months when they were gonna open their table games. So we reached out and worked out a, a, a partnership, literally a partnership, where they provided all the equipment, the tables, the supplies, everything we needed. We went and got an approved curriculum. We had to buy an approved curriculum that was approved by the State Gaming Commission. And the biggest challenge we had was gonna be getting 
trainers? Where do you find people to teach table games in Pennsylvania that never had table games? So I talked to their president and I suggested that they hire their management people, their pit bosses and floor bosses and the people who would be managing their dealers, hire them three months earlier than when they would normally hire them. And then we'll hire them as adjunct professors to teach the casino courses here at the college. And that's exactly what we did. So we ended up with the best possible training team you could have. They ended up training the people that they were going to hire anyway and eventually become working for them. They got to know all our students really well. Um, we knew we had a great curriculum because they, they tweaked it a little bit to make sure it met their needs. So when we were done with that first three months and graduated more than 500 people to go work over there, um, it was just a home run all around. And they were very happy. They were very excited. Our students were happy. They had to pay for the training. They, and so we were happy, quote, because we made some money. But more importantly, we helped 500 people get jobs. And at that time, if you remember, that's when the economy was in the tank. There were no jobs. So we were training real estate agents and accountants and all kinds of people who had been full-time employed up until a year before. And now, because of this program, they were able to get full-time jobs with benefits. And pay was adequate, $35,000, $40,000 a year. Not too bad for three months of training. So um, yeah, that was, that was a real home run. We got a lot of uh, publicity and a lot of notoriety for that. And uh, I just, you know, all around, we just, it was just a really, really good project. I mean, we have many of our culinary students that end up working at the various restaurants there, our hospitality students, hotel and restaurant management students. Uh, maybe the biggest partnership that was started long ago and continues very strong is the Food and Wine Festival, where all the proceeds go to the college for scholarships. That's like a quarter million dollars a year. And uh, one of the other really cool things about that is that several times Emeril Lagasse has come himself, and whether he's here or not, Several of our students get selected, of our culinary students, get selected to go do an internship at his flagship operation in New Orleans. So when you think about a community college, somebody from a community college getting their degree in culinary arts and on their resume it says that they interned with Emeril Lagasse in New Orleans. I mean, that's, that's an amazing accomplishment for, uh, not, that's an amazing opportunity for these, these young people to start a career in a really, really interesting and, and, and uh, fast-growing uh, industry. Yeah, what, you know, one of the things we were worried about is how well would the Sands people fit into this local community. Um, most of the leadership came from Las Vegas or Atlantic City or other places around the country, very, very experienced, high-end uh, executives. And so uh, when they first moved into our building, and our building, you know, everything goes in here. Um, we've got kids programs and all kinds of fun stuff that goes on in here in addition to the more serious uh, programs we have. So one day, shortly after uh, the casino folks had moved in, we have a program here called um, Cops and Kids Reading Room, where we serve um, underprivileged kids and help, help them with youth literacy issues, give them books and things. Well, the director of that invited the uh, local high school, the Liberty High School bagpipe band to come and perform in the building for these kids up on the fifth floor at the time. Well, they marched right through the lobby. Now, the Sands offices are immediately adjacent to the lobby. So the bagpipers came marching through the lobby, playing their bag bagpipes and just blasting it out, echoing all through the lobby. And I just thought, oh God, this is not going to be good. Our, our tenants are going to hate this. They're business people. Instead, they all came out of their offices and stood at the side of the lobby, watched the, the uh, bagpipers go through. They applauded them as they got on the elevator. And then they got on the elevator and followed them up. They actually went up and watched the, uh, the kids uh, listening to the, uh, the bagpipers. And it was just amazing. Right then, that's when I knew that these are the people we want to work with. We know these folks are going to be great in this community, and, and absolutely they are.
But from what I've read, um, you know, I hear all the right things. Um, I think it's really important, and I, and I hope this happens because this is what I've heard they want to do, is to keep the current management team. Um, have that continuity because there's commitment to the, to the community. And then if the new owners you know, are a little more receptive to the idea of developing around the casino, um, I think that's only good news for us. For, for, from what I understand for the new owners, this will be their flagship operation instead of you know, just a small thing in some backwater little town in Pennsylvania. This will be their primary, their biggest uh, property. So I, I hope they uh, want to develop the properties around that because it's, it will reflect on them in a really positive way.